Welcome to Quality Digest Live Roundtable. Today's topic, the future of metrology. See you in one minute. Today's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Hexagon Metrology. Hexagon carries the widest range of quality brands. With an extensive support network, Hexagon is also your partner. Hexagon Metrology. We are Metrology. Hello and welcome to the Quality Digest Live Roundtable. I'm your host, Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. We're at the Hexagon Live User Conference in Las Vegas and today we're going to discuss industrial metrology. Where's it going? What are the trends? Do we have a workforce prepared to take 3D measurements using a variety of equipment in, in more and more diverse environments? And joining me today are Dr. John Zeigert, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, Zvonimir Kotnik, Director of Business Operations at Hexagon Metrology, and Steve Starner, District Manager West for Hexagon Metrology. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. This is going to be just kind of an open discussion. Uh, I want, uh, I'll be asking different questions. Some of them might be, might be directed to one of you or the other, but just feel free to jump in, uh, even if it's not your question, all right? Great. Okay, Great. So first of all, I want to start off with, um, let's talk about CMMs. Uh, it's a legacy machine. It's been around for a jillion years. Are they going away? Is the accuracy still there? Is, is the market still there for it? What, what's happening with CMMs? Uh, no, I absolutely think machines are here here to stay, Dirk. Uh, we thought at one point that our standard, uh, if you will, traditional bridge machines were starting to come down in demand and then more portable technology was starting to take off. Uh, we, we're not seeing that any longer. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the stationary business is, is still still very solid and it's growing, but what's really taking off is the portable metrology, the trackers, arms, um, and portable equipment in general. So we see more and more demand there, and that's, that's growing, doubling in size, year, or probably about 20% year over year. Okay, and, and Steve, are you, from, a, from a sales point of view, are you kind of seeing the same thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're going anywhere. I think it's kind of a, a dichotomy to talk about uh, an automated CMM going away, and yet at the same time we talk about automation in manufacturing. Certainly, I don't think um, we're going to see people going to manually operated portable metrology equipment for all applications. Uh, but one of the things that I think has kind of brought new life to a CMM is the different sensors that go on the end. So you're not just touch probing parts anymore, now you have cameras and laser line scanners and you know, if you think of a CMM as kind of a three-axis robot, so it's really just automation. Um, uh, you know, it seems like it's got a future. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, about accuracy. I mean, is the accuracy of uh, non-contact scanning? I mean, is that uh, is that approaching the accuracy of CMMs, or are we still a long way off from that? I mean, CMMs are what uh, what one or two microns right now? Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and no, not yet. Right, so it's, it all depends on the application. And frankly, you don't always need a laser scan. You know, laser scanning gets you a lot more data, a lot more quickly. Uh, maybe there's some other advantages, but, but I don't see uh, laser scanning applicable to all applications either. I think you're still gonna touch pro parts sometimes. Well, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to, uh, um, to John here for a little mm -hmm. bit. I mean, just from okay. a kind of educational point of view, mm -hmm. um, a lot of changes in metrology over the last what, 50, yeah, 60 years. Yes. I mean, what's what's happening in terms of uh, colleges and universities and kind of the transfer of knowledge from this this all this new technology from companies like Hexagon, and is that being is that being taught in, in colleges and universities? Well, um, so colleges and universities. Uh, have trouble keeping up with new technology because of the expense and because we're typically pretty slow to react in our curriculum. But the reality is that we are trying to educate students about basic principles, not about how to operate a particular piece of equipment or piece of software. Um, and so the, the good news is that uh, in metrology or in education, manufacturing education, Metrology is now recognized as a distinct, important subject to be covered. Whereas 30 or 40 years ago, it was, you, know, you teach somebody how to read a hand micrometer and now you've covered metrology. And now it really is 
combined with 3D modeling and CAD systems uh, uh, a, a part of that package. And uh, in that sense, is very much part of the curriculum. Right. Okay. Well, and what are you guys seeing? I mean, are the people who are starting to use your equipment, I mean, you get some, some young guy or, or gal out of college, uh, they get hired uh, either by Hexagon or they get hired by one of your customers. Do they understand measurement principles? I mean, do, do they understand how to use the equipment properly? I'll answer that. So I think, uh, I think it's always challenging, especially right now, to find qualified people who know the principles or the basics behind it, um, as well as the specific, say, product or software that, we're, that, we're, uh, that they're going to operate from us in particular. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about, but we could, is uh, Hexagon Metrology U, sure. which is .com, hexagonmetrologyu.com which uh, I think helps a lot of our customers when they bring people in. You can easily send someone to get trained on PCDMAS from us, but maybe they need a background in blueprint reading, for instance, and then go on there and get a course in that as well. Right. So I think that helps. Do, do, you see, uh, do you guys see that as being something that uh, more and more companies like, like Hexagon, you know, the, the equipment, the test and measurement equipment manufacturers, where they're going to have to take on some of that burden themselves on, on training up how to use their equipment properly and, and measurement fundamentals, I mean, just kind of following on from a... Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, we talk about higher education, we talk about OEMs like Hexagon, and certainly I think we all have a responsibility uh, to help grow the workforce, a technically proficient workforce, the way we need to. And if it doesn't happen, I think it's just going to be your equipment that doesn't perform correctly, your customers who aren't going to be successful, um, and overall that's kind of a representation of you. So we actually put, I think, quite a bit of effort into uh, trying to support uh, developing up a user base. Well, Dirk, but I think um, it goes just beyond metrology. I think if you read uh, different publications and articles, uh, it is stated that in general in the United States we do lack a qualified workforce in manufacturing. So, I mean, there is a bigger problem, not just in metrology. So. Well, how important is it, uh, John, for, for companies uh, like Hexagon and the rest to be involved in kind of that process, the educational process, either through uh, through, I don't know, equipment donations or just expertise and that sort of thing. Is, is that really something where industry needs to be involved? Particularly, yes, because particularly at the pace of change uh, and modernization of this equipment. The, if you look around here at the equipment that's being sold here today or being demonstrated here today, 15 years ago, much of it didn't even exist. People didn't even think about that. And uh, so it's very difficult to, to keep your curriculum up to date and um, because, quite frankly, because the professors who are the ones who make the curriculum are not actively working in industry, very often they, are, they themselves are not up to date. And so it's really, really critical for the leading companies in the industry to involve themselves with leading educational institutions to make sure there is a, a basis and a place where trained people, or where people can be trained. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, some some sales trends. I mean, mm -hmm. from from your perspective, uh, obviously you're the you're the west uh, the western region for for Hexagon here yeah. in the in the states, right? Yeah. So, in terms of interest in particular tech types of technologies, what's going on there? Yeah. Good, good question. Um, Everybody has maybe a different need or maybe even companies are progressing through different stages of uh, uh, sophistication, call it. Um, but what I see the most is uh, for a lot of larger companies like aerospace companies, maybe automation. Let's figure out a way to get this done uh, automatically, more repeatably, less variables with less labor involved, number one. Um, and then automation on some smaller parts uh, tied around uh, like machining cells. So people want lights out manufacturing, but what you don't want to do is make parts all night long that are wrong. Right. Right? So you have to tie that in uh, in an automated way. So those are kind of two of the trends I see. And, and when, you say, when you say automation, are you talking, uh, we're, we're talking feedback, some sort of measurement feedback, so you're automatically measuring a part and that information is fed back into the process to make corrections or, or that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, great question. So first right. of all, you have to have physical automation, you have to get a part out of a machine onto an inspection device. Um, but then you have to, if that part is bad, you have to do something about it. So someone has to be notified, or the machine has to be corrected, 
And this, in some cases, can happen automatically. Okay. Um, we were talking earlier, actually, uh, Z, we were yeah. talking about, uh, uh, I believe you were talking about automation. I think we were talking about inline automation. Right. And is, that, is this along the same lines, or is this something different? Uh, well, it, it is both. Uh, we're getting more and more requests for inline automation. And, and what is that exactly? Uh, that's uh, automation where you're going from process one, two, three, four, and it's all in line. So you're going through the manufacturing process that is all following along uh, a single line, if you will. So as you go from one, one process that you have finished to the next, you want to make sure that everything is done correctly as you progress. So at the, the end of the day, you're making a good part, not a bad part throughout, the, throughout it. Uh, John, in, t in terms of, of uh, what, what Z and C were just talking about, um, our modern processing techniques, are those kind of things being taught at the university level? I mean, obviously there's the equipment, but there's also just new ways for, uh, for parts to be manufactured and the whole cell technique and that sort of thing. Is that, is that part of curriculum? Um, to a certain extent, yes. Um, I think that what the comments they were making about automation is more than just uh, removing the human from, from the operation. I think that the trend for automation and metrology is really tight integration of sensing and metrology into the process, not yeah. as a separate activity. And and what, what really makes that a value added is if the result can be actually used in a closed loop control sense rather than just a sorting sense. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I think we see a, a really clear trend toward that, particularly in manufacturers, uh, high value, low volume production where you have to get every part right um, every time. And I think it will spread from there into more of the mass production. Is, is there, is one of the uh, uh, roadblocks for a feedback like you guys are talking about, is it the problem of, of sharing data? As I mean, you, you have some sort of, let's say, hexagon scanner that's scanning a part, now it's got some sort of data, and now it has to get this data back to some sort of machine tool that may not speak the same language. I mean, is that an issue, or have those been resolved? They're all custom products. There is nothing legis that is that is standardized, that we have at least standardized on at this point. So I think it would be a good to get to a point where the products and offerings are more standardized so you can pretty much go and do some type of a plug and play uh, kind of a device and offering. Um, so that's where I see that we can do a, a better job as we go forward um, to, to provide something that is more integrated in that sense as well. Okay. What about, um, what about new markets that are opening up? Have you guys, uh, or, or Steve, I guess you, seen um, industries come in that were, let's say, non-traditional industries? And I'll give an example. Um, a friend of mine had a granite countertop installed at one point, and he brought in an arm yeah. to, to yeah, take the measurements. Yes. And, 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 and I'm going, an arm? You know, last time I saw an arm, it was out at some you know, aerospace company. I mean, what the heck is this guy doing in here with an arm to measure right. a granite yeah. countertop? <laughs> right. And that's kind of a non-traditional industry. Are you seeing anything in any the industries that are kind of opening up? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, in particular, uh, we, you know, one of the things you see here at Hexagon is it's all about, we have, you know, first we used to talk about how can we get more data. Now we're talking about how can we analyze that data and how can we do something with it. And from my point of view, it happens you know, across industries. And you probably see that no, nowhere more than right here at this event. Um, whether it's a, a grader on a work site, or someone constructing a bridge, or someone you know, doing some repair inside of an aircraft assembly facility. Um, you know, these are, there's, a, there's data being gathered and analyzed across the board. You talked about uh, countertops, and certainly the key there is that you're getting digital data that you can transmit to someone quickly, um, whereas maybe they used to use a cardboard template and drive it somewhere. Uh, and, and I think that's a great example, and I think there's almost nowhere it's not happening. Okay. Um, so Dirk, if I may interrupt, we also talked about the data, data collection. The volume of data is getting so high. It's, it's, it's a lot of, lot of data. The ability to 
more effectively and efficiently store this data, especially so you can have a history of your different processes uh, uh, would be very helpful as well. Especially when you get into safety critical applications, whether that's like a medical or aerospace related, where you have to have the history of the part that was manufactured with all the uh, digital information um, in the inspection requirements and data. Uh, I think that's that, that needs to be addressed as well. And I think you have seen maybe in some of our um, keynote uh, uh, keynotes uh, earlier this week that that's something that hexagon metrology is uh, uh, trying to address at, the mo at this moment in time. So. Okay, let's. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned data and data processing. I mean, I'll, I'll, let me throw this back to John here. Mm -hmm. Is to me, everything starts with, with education. I mean, obviously, you've got to have people coming in knowing how to use equipment, knowing how to uh, uh, handle the equipment, take measurements. You also need people who know how to handle the data. And again, is that something that you feel is being covered adequately uh, at the college and university level? No, probably not. Um, you know, we are, uh, well, well, students come in much more comfortable with the digital world than, than a generation ago. This is, they've never known anything but that, and so they have an expectation that everything will be in digital form. Um, but we still suffer from interoperability problems, translation problems, et cetera, that, are, that plague industry as well. Yeah. That the data that the CAD model used may not work with the FEA you use, almost certainly won't work with the CAM program you want to use, um, and so we struggle with it just like industry does. Well, is there something that, uh, again, on the, along that same lines is we talked about what can be done to help the colleges and universities in terms of hardware, mm -hmm. what about in terms of software? Uh, it's kind of the same question. What could be done to help improve the curriculum uh, or and help improve the student experience so that when they come out they're prepared not only to use the equipment but also the software that runs it? So in many ways in software, universities are in a better, an easier position than with hardware because the marginal cost for a software company to produce an extra copy and a, an educational license, their marginal cost is essentially zero. And so all of the big software houses have educational programs um, that enable us to give students experience with at least a, a, you know, a, an abridged version of the, of the full-blown package. And, and the software houses see this as an advantage because students when they graduate and become engineers, they naturally gravitate toward the package they're familiar yep. with. Yeah, um, worked for Apple. And so, <laughs> our, in that sense, the universities are a little bit different. We have more people trying to get us to use software than we actually have time in the curriculum to meaningfully address. Okay. Let's uh, get back to technology again. Uh, the big buzzword a few years ago was multi-sensor. Everybody was coming out with a multi-sensor machine, right? Mm -hmm. Is that still the case where it's still very popular or is that kind of matured or was it uh, something that was just a, a flash in the pan? I mean, where is multi-sensor today? Um, can I take this? Absolutely. Okay, I'll start. Um, multi-sensor is still here. I don't think it's as, uh, is, it's as big of a buzzword. Uh, it's nice to have a system that you know that is flexible, that you could add an additional sensor in the future if that need arises in your manufacturing process, especially if you're a job shop, right? You, don't, you never know what you're going to come across next. So the idea is to have the system that is flexible enough that you could add a sensor in it. But really the application today of using a multiple of sensors um, it's not really there. Not too many people do it, if you will. Maybe I'll use a couple sensors at a time at most, but I probably won't load a machine with four or five different sensors because most of my applications won't require it. So, so. It's, it's still necessary, but, but rather yes. than, I think there was this view that you would have all these different sensors, and you're saying, yeah, it comes down to a couple. Right. Maybe a non-contact and a touch probe, and I'm good. Yeah, right. okay. yeah. And you know, we used to talk about multi-sensors oftentimes tied to our vision machine. Like, a, it was a vision machine that had a touch probe, and now it's a multi-sensor. And uh, I do think people talk about it less, um, and, and I think they'll continue to talk about it less, but only because it's going to become more of an assumption, right? It's not because it's going away. It's not because you're not using multi multiple sensors. It's because you're going to expect 
that any machine you buy can do that. So if you think about our Leica trackers, you can touch probe and you can scan. Roamer arms, the same thing. Bridge machines, the same thing. Vision machines, the same thing. So it's almost an expectation. So why, why use it as a buzzword? Yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, let's talk about just the kind of the state of technology today. So, and I'll just step, step through, and I'm looking more kind of accuracy, speed, um, and, and, and maybe if you can say, well, it used to be like this, and now it's like this. So let, let's say, let's say a, a laser tracker. Um, where, where, where did it come from, or where is it today? Okay. Where did it come from? No, I mean, well, in, in terms of right. accuracy. Right, ah, okay, accuracy oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I can say that the accuracy is changing drastically. I think the trackers are more accurate, but it's not so much the accuracy, it's more uh, today's user friendliness of the trackers, at least the technology that Hexagon has been able to put into the trackers to make them uh, more friendly. For example, in your uh, 10 years ago with the trackers, uh, the corner cube was the only device that you could use to make the measurements with. And then if you broke the beam, you had to put it back into a bird bath uh, to reacquire the beam, and then you had to go back and make the measurements. Today, you absolutely don't have to do, do that because you just will reacquire the beam right in the mid-air and continue your measurements like nothing has happened. The same thing is with the T-probe device as well. Now you can uh, take advantage of having a six degrees of freedom device in your hand, making the measurements at, at a very high, uh, large distances. Okay, what about uh, so, laser scanners? Um, laser scanners, um, laser scanners are getting a little bit more accurate but really the ability of the scanners today is to have a, maybe a wider stripe, uh, more stand of distance, so you have more area to work with uh, that obviously can be attractive to many. And you're hearing the laser scanners that can collect 100,000 points per second or 500,000 points per second. At the end of the day, it's not so much the resolution, but it's the quality of the data that you're getting uh, and that you're returning back from the part you're scanning. And, and, and when you say quality, are you talking in terms of noise, uh, uh, the, the physical quality of the, of, of the, of the return beam, essentially, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Um, the old workhorse CMMs. I mean, uh, Hexagon still sells CMMs. Um, are, are they more accurate than ever, faster, easier to use? Um, the CMM is a CMM is a CMM, right? It will collect the data. What the difference is and what we're trying to accomplish as the organization to, to allow customers a different way of interacting with the system. I think that's really where, where we need to go more because all the CMMs are made pretty much the same way. Uh, they use the similar big, big technologies, piece of yeah. <laughs> yeah right. very similar technologies, but it's really how you interact with the product that makes a difference. Uh, how quickly I can select the data information, how you can extract that um, actionable intelligence out of out of the program and, and the data that I'm uh, that I'm measuring and collecting. So that's where we think that uh, that that we want to concentrate more time. So the, so the differentiation. Is, is going to come not so much from maybe the, the, the actual specs of a particular product, right. whether it's a CMM or a, or a laser tracker or laser scanner. You're saying the differentiation between you guys and anybody else is going to be, is going to be a user interface. Is, is it easier to use? That is correct, yes. Um, John, from, from your students' perspective, what seems to be the, the technology that they like, that, that seems to be most exciting. They're, they're anxious to get their hands on an arm or a laser scanner or a tracker, I mean. So, things that are fastest and easiest to use. Arm type CMMs are very intuitive for students to use. Yeah. They understand what it's trying, they don't understand how it works, but they understand what the purpose of it and, yeah. and they're able to, to get up and running on that very quickly. Um, and, and with very little training and background. I'd say that is probably the, the one that students gravitate to most. It has the best combination of large measuring range, flexibility of use, low, short learning curve, et cetera, compared to the others. Okay. Um, we're getting close on time here. I do want to touch on a couple things. Um, what material or uh, maybe optical advances, some material advances, optical advances, 
hold promise for the future of metrology. Is, is there anything going on right now that maybe uh, you guys have seen or, or Hexagon is looking at that's going, wow, once this, once this, uh, this material is more mature, or once this, this uh, optical thing is more mature, wow, that's going to be an, an, awesome, an awesome thing for the industry. Is there anything like that going on? Um, so I, I don't know about material or, or optics necessarily. Uh, for us, I mean, parts are getting more accurate, right? They're oftentimes just more complex because what used to be three pieces going together is now sort of one. Um, but, uh, but what I do see, and I do see uh, laser scanners, or I should say non-contact and point clouds growing. So for us, our Cognitins white light scanner is something I think holds a lot of promise. Um, largely because of its ability to gather a lot of data quickly, maybe more quickly than any other sensor we have. Um, and then once you capture that data, you can analyze it at will. Right? So you, you've got it, and now you can interrogate whatever you want on that part. Okay. Um, but John, if, if I may, I think there is other, there is other probably areas that uh, in the long term, that's maybe short term, but in the long term, uh, even with some of the research that has been um, happening, uh, that I have been reading at least. Uh, if we talk about disruptive technologies, what's the next disruptive technology or idea that is out there? You're hearing more and more about 3D printing, where the 3D printing is going, right? right. So how is that going to affect in the future that we manufacture components? When you read a report that by 2025, it's projected that uh, 3D printing technology is going to be a $700 billion dollar industry a year by 2025. 700 billion? Billion. Wow. Out of which uh, 35 to uh, in manufacturing, in manufacturing. That, that means just what we do, right? Um, and 35 to 50 percent of the components it's projected that will be made using the 3D printing uh, machines. So it will change the game of the way we check the parts because now you're really doing truly inline inspection well, I was say, how, you how, want to do how, that, how do right? Feel, how do you see uh, measurement technology tying into 3D printing? I mean, other than maybe scanning a part and creating a CAD drawing, oh, now I'm going to print it. I mean, I, I'm not sure I follow where the, where the connection is. Well, I mean, with the 3D printing, the way you, uh, you print or to make the part, you grow it uh, one layer at a sure, time. Right. So by being able to grow one layer at a time, now you're in real time able to make adjustments, even if it's minute adjustments, as you grow the part to make sure that every part that you make is actually 100% good, right? And it doesn't so, have errors, so you're not now doing the measurement at the end of, uh, uh, at the, yeah, end of the so, task. So I, I completely agree with the, um, the, we're involved actually in a, some proposals for in-process sensing for 3D printing. Um, it's it's going to be a challenge for traditional metrology because in 3D printing it allows you to make completely enclosed internal features that may be yeah. functional but that you couldn't ever reach with a cutting tool or anything like that and so by <laughs> definition you're not going to reach them with your touch probe. Right. Um, and so there is a, uh, a lot to be said for uh, the, this disruptive technology and the effect it's going to have on the metrology needs. So, so if I understand you, understand you right, you're talking about as, as it's laying down, let's say, a layer of plastic or centered metal or whatever, Correct. it might scan each layer, check to make sure it's doing what you think it's doing, and maybe it could even feed back and it change the process even as, as, it's, being, as it's being built on the fly. Absolutely. So Absolutely. in direct metal laser centering, part shrinkage is a big issue. You need to be able to be scanning the centered, the boundaries of the, the solidified and fused layer in real time and stacking those digitally to create the part um, that you've actually made. Has anybody, has anybody come to you guys saying, hey, we, we have this kind of application, can you guys do this kind of thing? Not you know? yet, but that, that's where, since we think that that's where the technology is going and we want to be part of it, that's definitely uh, in our, one of our interests to pursue okay. going forward. Um, just, to, just to, we, we got like two or three minutes left. Anything you guys want to want to add that maybe we didn't talk about here that's related to what you think is important about where this this industry is going, the, the metrology industry, particularly 3D, if, if we're talking about it. either education or technology or, or whatever. I'll, I'll jump in there. All right. So, so I think the future of metrology is for it to stop being a separate process that's, yeah. that's <laughs> separated from the actual manufacturing. Yeah. The future is all of those sensors are going to get miniaturized, wireless, integrated into the machines, and 
collect data in real time as the process is going on, and the big win happens when you can start closing control loops around the actual metrological specifications of interest as opposed to pseudo proxy variables like axis position of your right, machine right. tool, which right. isn't actually the dimension of your yeah. part. Yeah. Right. I would have said the same thing. So I think uh, and it, there's technology that needs to change, there's, but there's also organizations that need to change. I mean, a, a typical quality organization X number of years ago would have operated purely as a filter, right? In no way, shape, or form did they keep you from making a bad part. They just kept that bad part from going outside the building. Right. Um, and more and more, it's getting integrated onto the shop floor, into the process, with a closed loop feedback. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's everything. That, I, I believe that's the future of metrology. And you're right. We're seeing it with, with more and more customers. They want, thing, they want things faster, easier. They want higher throughput. They want all these processes to be on and in the manufacturing floors. You have limited space. They want everything to be smaller. They want to squeeze more uh, dollar per square foot out of their, their operation. And I mean, it's, they're being quite demanding, which rightfully so. <laughs> And we're there to help them. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, this was this was great. We covered a lot of areas. We covered uh, education, uh, inline processing, and uh, it sounds like what we're talking about is. I think you wrapped it up beautifully, is, is the future is, forget about this being a separate thing, we've got to be working towards everything to be integrated so that uh, 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 the whole process is one piece and, and you don't have these different silos working apart from each other, so. Yeah. All right, well thank you. Uh, again, we've, we've had uh, John Ziegler, uh, Steve uh, Star uh, Starner, right? Yep, uh, Zvonimir Kotnik. And uh, thank you guys for joining us and we hope to see you again at the next Quality Digest Roundtable. Next slide. Thank <laughs> you.